Okay. All right. Let's welcome Katerina Skrubelu from Upstream. Yep. Real-time interactions with Angular and WebSockets. Hi, all. Um, I have a little bit of a stage fright today. I don't usually get a stage fright, but I know that some of you make a very demanding audience. And also, speaking in front of people you care about actually makes it a bit more difficult because you want to give the best of yourself. So, yeah. I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> So, uh, we're going to talk about real-time interactions with Angular and WebSockets. And, uh, yeah, that is my Twitter handle. You can follow me. And before we begin, I'm going to start by telling you a small tale. So, that is my mother there, and that is her optical mouse. So, uh, my mother is not so tech-savvy, so uh, a few years ago, she wanted to learn how to use the computer, so I gave her my laptop. I also taught her how to use the mouse, this optical mouse. I taught her how to move it on the table, to move the cursor around, everything was fine. After some time passed, my mother wanted to learn how to watch movies from the laptop to the TV. So what I did was I took her laptop, I connected it to the TV, I gave her her optical mouse. I told her, you can sit on your couch and you can use your mouse just like you did before, just like a remote control, and you can control the TV, which is far away from you, with your mouse and everything will be fine. So I set it up, I left the house. 10 minutes later, my mother calls me all panicked. Katerina, it's not working. I moved the mouse, nothing is happening. I tried to troubleshoot via the phone. No possibility, so I had to go back to the house. And I saw my mother holding her mouse and doing like this in the air, trying to move the cursor. Yeah, you're supposed to laugh here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, yeah, so what my mother didn't know was that actually the mouse has an LED and a light sensor and it needs a surface so that the LED can reflect red by the light sensor so that it can translate this motion to motion on the laptop screen. She didn't know that. And she just used her physical motion like she did normally to control it. And, but she couldn't do it. And I thought, why couldn't she do it, really? Why not use her physical motion to move the cursor? Apparently, that's what people at Nintendo thought, and they made Wii, as we all know. But I thought, why couldn't she do it with a device that she already has, like her iPad or her smartphone, for example? because these devices here have all the sensor we want to translate 3D motion and not just 2D motion on a surface with all the sensors they have. And why would she need to install an application to do it where she can do it in her browser, on her phone and on her laptop because JavaScript does that, JavaScript does read sensors. So what we're going to see today is just that, how to use sensors with JavaScript from our browser, from our phone to the laptop, my laptop here. So the summary today is we're going to see how we're going to capture this sensor data, uh, then how we're going to send it to another place, which is my laptop here, uh, how we're going to translate this into virtual motion, graphics on the screen, and in the end, we're going to try it all together and hope it works. So a little bit about myself. I'm a front-end web developer at AppStream. Um, I'm an, Athen an Angular Athens co-organizer, and some other organizers are here as well. I studied spatial analysis and spatial data visualization. I worked a lot with AngularJS, and I live in Athens, and I code with my cat on my lap, and I feed on milk and cereal. <laughs> yeah. So. Why do you need this? Why do you need to read device sensors? First of all, we're going to make an interface that makes use of physical motion. Uh, it could be used in games, as we said, we does it and it uses it. And it could also be used by people who are less accustomed to other types of user interface, like the mouse, as my mother, or the trackpad, the keyboard. It could make things more accessible, possibly, if used in the right way. So the tools we're going to be using today is going to be WebSockets. Actually, it's going to be the Socket.io library, uh, Angular, obviously, 
and device sensor events, the motion, the acceleration, and the light sensor. So why are we using WebSockets? We want an uninterrupted connection between our phone and the server and the computer. And this is what WebSockets do. They provide us with an interactive communication session between our browser and the server. Uh, because also, the, as the device moves, it keeps sending event messages. We, want, we don't want to have to pull the server for a reply, as we would do with the REST protocol. Also, we want a persistent connection because the rate of the messages is going to be continuous, and we want this to not stop. We want to be bidirectional, so we want the server to receive, we want it to send, and we want our browser to also receive and send replies. And this is what happens with bidirectional uh, communication. It also establishes full duplex communication, uh, which means that the two parties can speak in um, independently of each other. And we also make use of a single TCP connection. That means we don't have to worry about handshakes all the time and fall and wait and everything. So that's why WebSockets. Uh, we will be using the Sockets I.O. library. Uh, the Socket I.O. actually uses WebSockets when it can. It will first run a feature detection to decide if the connection will be established with WebSockets. If it can, it will. Otherwise, it will, lose AJAC, it will use AJAC long polling, FLAS, or anything else that can make our application work everywhere. Why Angular? You don't actually have to use Angular to do this, but we are going to use it. And uh, I'm using the RxJS library which I'm not going to explain today. Uh, why, though? Uh, because RxJS uh, has subjects, and subjects are both observable and observers. Uh, they can listen and send messages, so they can establish this connection that we want, the bidirectional flow. Uh, so how the subject works is it watches WebSockets for incoming messages and broadcasts these messages to any component subscribed to it. So they receive data, they send it to a component, we see it on our view, and the other way around. And there is a very nice tutorial by Elliot Forbes. I'm going to have the links in the end of the presentation if you want to see it. So the other thing we need is device sensor events. So uh, the first uh, device sensor event we're going to be using is the device motion event. Uh, will use the acceleration and the acceleration including gravity, uh, which will give us the acceleration of the device on the three axes, the X, Y, and Z. And it is presented in meters by squared seconds. So this is the method that captures it. It's just a, um, a window, a, an event listener to our dome, to our window, and it listens for device motion, and then it brings us back uh, three different uh, coordinates. So uh, this is a live uh, part of the website we're going to use later. So as you see, I'm moving my phone, and there are some readings on the screen that are changing. We're going to see how they're changing. If you see the most left column, which is the device motion event, is the one I'm moving and the one that is reading these readings. So how does this work? Uh, as you see the pictures below, this is the device coordination frame, the X, Y, and Z axis. And the other one is a piezoelectric accelerometer, which is what your devices make use of to capture this acceleration. So roughly, how does this accelerometer work? Uh, accelerometers are usually made of piezoelectric materials, like quartz crystals. And what these materials essentially do is, well, in, uh, in a system like our phone, we can only measure uh, differences in the current and the load. So the, the acceleration that we're doing on our phone loads these elements and according to the Newton's second law of motion. So that force can be observed in the, in the chains of the electrostatic force or the voltage which is on the crystal. And our phone can measure this voltage change and spit out the acceleration data. Uh, sorry. Uh, the other thing we're going to be using 
is a device orientation event. So again, uh, the device orientation uses the alpha, the beta, and the gamma, which are differences in rotation in this axis, in the orientation of this axis, and it can again be read through an event listener to our bound to our window, which is the device orientation. And as simply as that, you can get this. And this event listener is fired every time uh, our phone changes orientation. So every time we're doing this, at every single degree that is changed, it's, the event is fired. So again, if you see at the second column, as I move this, the phone, the the numbers are changing. So, how does it work? Uh, again, you can see in the diagrams there the three the three axes that are being used: the alpha, the beta, and the gamma. And you can also see a mechanical gyroscope. And I've also brought a mechanical gyroscope here today to uh, explain how it moves in a way. But I'm going to make it spin afterwards because it always falls from my hands, and we're, you're going to laugh and. Yeah, so how do the, the gyroscopes work? Uh, in our phones, we, this is a gyroscope. I don't, I'm not sure if you can see it, but in, our phones obviously don't have such kind of things inside them. They have another type of gyroscope, which are microelectromechanical system gyroscopes, which are vibrating structure gyroscopes instead of rotating structure gyroscopes that are these kind of things. So. Uh, again, according to Newton, a, a vibrating object tends to continue vibrating in the same plane even if its support rotates. Uh, the Coriolis effect causes the object to exert a force on its support, and this is done in order to conserve the angular momentum, as we know from the law of the conservation. Uh, so, by measuring this force, the rate of rotation can be determined. So yeah, when rotating, the orientation of this axis is unaffected by tilting or rotation of the mountain according to the conservation of the angular momentum. So as you're going to see here, I'm warning you, it's going to fall from my hands. <laughs> um, the gyroscope is going to be rotating and then I'm going to try it and obviously if I leave it like this, it falls. But since it's rotating, it, it will try to maintain a steady... Uh, Posture, I don't know how to call it. So, if it's rotating very fast, okay, let me do it once more <laughs> to show you. And then we're going to leave it to it, and you're going to see it in the break. So, yeah. So the gyroscope is rotating. And if we do it like this, it's, it sits almost uh, perpendicular. Never mind, it didn't work very well. But you get that it's the, because of the conservation of the angular momentum. So, another sensor uh, our phone has is the device light event. So it is a sensor uh, on the front of your screen. It might be next to your camera. So information from this photo sensor or similar detectors uh, they detect ambient light levels near the device and they're measured in lux. So lux measures the perceived power of light. And again, uh, we're adding a an event listener to our window, which is the device light, which is fired every time the, uh, the lighting is changed. So again, if you see the, um, the third uh, column there, I have a flashlight here. If we put a lot of light on the sensor, it goes up to 5,000. If I cover it, it goes down to 20. <laughs> uh, so yeah, this is because of the photodiodes that these sensors have and how they work. Uh, the photodiode is a semiconductor that converts light into electrical current. And as we said, we can measure electrical current with our small devices. Uh, another measurement that we take is a device proximity event. So, this measures the distance of a nearby physical object using the proximity sensor. Again, the proximity sensor is close to your camera. Uh, so it uses a, a value of the proximity and it also has a minimum and a maximum value, obviously. So again, this is the event listener we're adding to our window for it. And it's not working in most browsers, so we're just going to see not a number, <laughs> however close or far I take my hand from the phone. 
And how it works? A proximity sensor uh, emits an, an electromagnetic field. Think of it like it sends out a light. And whenever there is a change in the way the light is reflected in the return signal, it measures that. So how do we tie it all together? Because we have the phone and we have the laptop and we want data from the phone to the laptop. Obviously, we will need a server. So uh, on, on the browser on my phone, I'm, I'm running an, an Angular web application, which is running a Socket.io client. The Socket.io client sends data to a server which I have deployed somewhere on the cloud. Uh, and I have uh, written a Node.js WebSocket server. And the Node.js WebSocket server sends back the data. And on my computer's uh, browser, I am running a Socket.io client again that is listening for incoming events. So let's get deeper now. I don't know if you can see these small letters, but I'm going to explain them anyhow. Uh, the first step on the mobile device is uh, it opens up a connection to the server. I don't know if you can see the code, but I'm going to zoom it uh, afterwards later. So it just opens a connection with this socket equals the code from the socket IO. Once the socket is open, JavaScript is listening for device motion events with the code we saw before. Each time a device event is fired, this time I move around my phone the event is fired, and each time the event is fired, it's emitted as a message containing this data. How the server uh, works now. So the server in the cloud, this, the, the event leaves from here, goes to the cloud, and the server starts listening to our desired port. Uh, so the server receives uh, this message, and once it receives it, it bounces it back from wherever it took it from. So on message received, message is emitted again. So yeah, it's like a mirror. And on a laptop, it, we, are again, we are again opening a WebSocket connection. The WebSocket receives a message from the server. The message is received and passed in our components. And I've written the little parenthesis, RxJS magic here <laughs> with the observables and the observers which I'm not going to explain how it works because it would be two different presentations. And then the motion type is checked. And according to the motion type, our view is updated with the new data. Let me see how much time I have. OK. So uh, the server code is almost this small. So. Whenever it receives it, it gets it back. Actually, the whole code is, I don't even have it open, do I? <laughs> Never mind. It's not very many lines apart from that, but we're going to see it later if you want. So what, uh, what you need now is, uh, as we're going to see, so this is the demo. So and we're going to play later with it, but as you see, uh, I have my device and it moves and, well, the idea behind that is uh, that as I move my device, the, the cat moves along a longer line. And, but the, the problem is that in order to achieve best events, you have to calibrate the results you're getting because different browsers and different devices emit different results. As I said, not all devices have, have all the sensors. Not all devices have the same frequency in updating the data. Not all device sensors have the same sensitivity. Not all browsers use the same coordinate system. And browsers do not handle coordinates in the same way. And even if a device does have a sensor, the browser might not support it. For example, uh, Firefox is the only browser right now that supports light. Chrome doesn't support light, no browser uh, supports stably the proximity sensor. So you really have to check before you implement. So let me run through my demo here. So yes, this is the, I'm moving the device and the kitten moves back and forth. <laughs> um, 
the scenery is dark, if I put light on it, the day comes, <laughs> and then the day leaves again. Um, also, this cube, as I'm holding my phone facing up, is coming towards me. If I move my phone facing down, it's moving far from me. You're going to try it later if you want. And again, the clock, as I move my phone, the, cur the, the, phone ha the clock hands move. So, measurements. In terms of visualization, as you saw, the orientation is easier to visualize since its numbers are within a range. They're from 0 to 360, and it's easier to map this on a straight line. Acceleration and motion numbers are more arbitrary, and sometimes they are less accurate. So, as you, if you see the, the, first, um, the first column, even if I'm holding the phone straight, it measures the, access, the, the acceleration of gravity, but the numbers flicker. They're not something you can really count on unless you do a very good uh, calibration. So, uh, let's try something. Why don't you try, last time I tried this, it crashed with a lot of people, but maybe you're less people here. So, just if you open your browser and you navigate to this address. Come on. I'm going to check the server logs. Okay, the server hasn't crashed yet, has it? No, it hasn't crashed yet, it's receiving good. So, uh, let's try the cube. So, if uh, everyone has their phone, oh. so if everyone has their phone facing up, the cube will be coming towards us, but Apparently, the server is not working so well <laughs> because too many people are on it. Well, okay. So, hi, some of you, please log off to see if the number of users is making a, a big, great bottleneck. <laughs> Well, never mind, we can try it a bit later because it doesn't seem to work very well, does it? <laughs> never mind, I don't know why. Uh, okay, we're going to check it afterwards with fewer of you, maybe. So, how can we move beyond this? What are the future aspirations? So, obviously, we need better calibration. We also need more uses and larger scale integrations, like a proper website. You could use uh, uh, maybe your phone or, uh, yeah, your phone and your phone sensors to move actual user interface elements on a real website and not just some SVG animations I showed you now. Uh, the way I have implemented it is not very secure because it has just uh, a free Node.js server that can receive anything from anyone, anytime, and it may be a bit inefficient since I'm opening a two-way route and in reality only one part receives and only one transmits, transmits each time. Um, different users are not treated differently. They could be distinguished in future demos. And in my next demo, I plan to use the Generic Sensor API, which is a new API for the web uh, that is uh, more, it's, it has a, gr a greater compatibility with browsers. It gives you an API so you can uh, declare your own classes and create your own sensors. And it also is more stable. So, um, that's all. But since we have time, uh, we can try something else. We can try, okay, now it's moving. So maybe no one is using it now. Uh, what we can do is we can try to do it again with fewer of you, 
or I could try and run a local server on my laptop and you could log into that. But maybe I don't want you all logged into my laptop. So I don't know if any of you is connected right now. No? Okay, maybe that's why it's moving. <laughs> Never mind. So yeah, that's all. Mm, but not quite all. Not quite all. <laughs> I tricked you there. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> I want to speak for just one minute about uh, I'm co-organizing Angular Athens with uh, some of the people who are in the audience here. Hi. <laughs> and yeah, it's our local Angular meetup. And if you Google it, you will find it. And please come to our next meetup if you want. There will be working demos of what I do. And you can also follow us on Twitter. And yeah, this is the end. <laughs> so. Thank you. Katerina, thank you very much. Yeah, you can find the code from what I did today on my GitHub account. You can copy it. You can find the slides. They are live right now. Again, if you log on Vox Athens and wherever you see yellow, it's a link. Just click it. And in the last slide, I have the references. So you can go and click away in the references as well. So I'll be happy to take questions because I think I have 15 minutes left. This is an opportunity to dive deep into Angular with Katarina. She's got 20 minutes to give you, give you some, uh, some insights. Go, guys. Questions? There is no Angular anguish? No? No? Oh, can we try again? Can we try again? Can we try again the app? The... Let's sure. try that. Let's try that. Let's try the, okay, let's try the cube. If you have your phone facing upwards, then the cube will be coming towards you. If you're facing downwards, it's going to leave. The cube is so always coming towards phone. you. <laughs> and yeah, you can try it a bit. Or if you want the scenery, I can do the scenery. I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> okay, so who's using it? Come on. Here. Something is moving. Now it stopped. I don't know how many users can Heroku handle simultaneously. I always blame it on Heroku. It died again. I'm sorry, people. But you can try it in your house by yourselves. It's live. Uh, come on, any questions? There we Not are. for NGRX, we please. Have, we, have, we have a question in the back here. We must then. Are you taking latency into consideration? in your implementations, the latency. I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. Are you taking latency into consideration? No. Come on, guys. Any more questions on that talk? No? Ah, oh, there we are. Uh, how do you actually test this thing? How do I? Do you actually test this kind of uh, code? That's a good question. Um, in terms of writing unit tests, I'm not sure, but you, I mean, I, the first thing I would do would be to check if I'm receiving events because sometimes the server just doesn't work uh, or in, uh, in the application running on the mobile phone, I would like to, to test the frequency of the events received to just uh, see how I could uh, make a better use of it. Um, he has a follow-up question. Now look. So you are, what do you do with, uh, with uh, missed events? If you miss in any events, 
in your uh, event stream? What do you, how do you handle this, uh, this thing? Can you repeat, please? I cannot hear. Okay. How would you handle missed events? Uh, I don't think you can actually handle missed events because they might be missing, they might not get transmitted in the first way or they might get lost in the server in some way or you might, the, the rate you're reading or the rate the observable is reading these messages might be different from the rate that it's receiving them so maybe they get lost in some part of the application that you don't know which part it is. So it's not a very stable application. I wouldn't, I wouldn't use it say, in somewhere in production, but it's just sort of a showcase that no. you can uh, try to build on. Yeah. Hi. So in this implementation, did you use uh, the numbers from the sensors raw, or did you actually do some uh, calibrations? And if, if you're planning to do any calibrations, uh, what, what kind of calibrations are you planning good, to do good question okay so yeah this is the event this is the application that's running on the, on the phone so from the phone I'm just sending the raw measurements but here I'm doing calibration so um, it, it was just random cal calibration playing with numbers uh, trial and error trial and error so for example uh, in the cube animation, I'm getting the rotation of the X, the rotation of the Y, and the Z, which is the distance. And I found that by dividing it with 100, I would get better results. So the only way you can do calibration really is by trial and error, because you never know how your application is going to handle the, the different types of events that the browser is sending. And also, I've tried this application with different kind of browsers and operating systems. I've tried it with Android and with, I, with iOS and the measurements are really different even uh, across browsers. For example, in Safari, the, the orientation is the opposite as in Chrome. So, Do you actually check for different browsers? Yes. Final question before we break for coffee. Oji? Katerina, thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much.